with Minister Malik Shabazz and for the last hour of April 17th, every Monday night, we're here with the Black in the Day and the 313 segment, an Afrocentric perspective on African and African American history in Detroit and of course everywhere that it may occur. occur. I want to say greetings to the TV33 WHPI family and greetings as well to the family that are viewing via Facebook. This is the Get Up Stand Up Show with Minister Malik Shabazz. Once again, I'm Baba Kafense. Chike, you're viewing us on TV33 WHPI broadcasting live from Highland Park, Michigan. We want to thank RJ Watkins and Watkins Broadcasting for allowing us this opportunity. And I also want to thank Minister Malik Shabazz for making the opportunity available as well. You can view us at WWTV33 WHPR, or you can also view us through a via the Android app, which is a go available at the Google Play Store, or through the Apple app, which is available at the Apple App Store. Greetings, my twin, birthday twin, sister Chikasha, Earl Trey Cole, and everybody else that may be watching. We appreciate your support. You can also view us via Google TV, the Roku box, Comcast Channel 91. We ask you to tune in. View us, listen, call in, share your perspective if you have some feedback, ideas for uh, segments that you or topics that you like may, may like to hear that are of relevance to the focus of the show. We ask you, of course, to reach out to me. You can reach me personally at Chike Kefense, and that's C-H-I-K-E-K-E-F-E-N-T-S-E at gmail.com. You can reach us during the broadcast live and unfortunately I don't res respond to the uh, Facebook comments uh, directly because I don't want to disrupt the technology. I want to keep the broadcast going and I, I don't want to risk possibly displacing my phone or something like that. But you can reach us on the air at 313-868-0351, 313-868-4336, 313-868-0342. And as usual, I like to just take a moment of silence for those African ancestors that have gone before us just to simply commemorate, venerate their spirit and energy and hope that they join us and sanction what we invigorate and move our people, restore our people to our tra traditional greatness and beyond. So we take a moment of silence for the ancestors. For those good, committed African ancestors that have gone before us, that not only died in the struggle, but lived their life in a way that was geared towards making life better for our people. We say, Ashe, Madasi Pa, Asante Sana, thank you very much. And in my announcements today, and I didn't really prepare well in the way of announcements, but I want to reiterate the announcement pertaining to the uh, a community engagement session hosted by the Detroit Black Community and Food Security Network in Just Food Detroit. Come out and learn about the future Detroit food, People's Food Co-op in Just Food Detroit and support their efforts. They're currently in the process of working to build a food co-op in the city of Detroit from the ground up that uh, will actually be the efforts of African Americans and Detroiters that are committed to feeding and making quality food available to the Detroit community at affordable prices. So they have two remaining uh, sessions where you can learn more, they call it engagement sessions, where you can learn more about their endeavors. And the next session will be April the 22nd at Earthworks, which is at 1264 Meldrum, Street, Detroit, Michigan, and on May the 20th at Avalon Village in Highland Park, and those sessions are two from 2 to 4 on those dates. Come out, see what they're doing, and see how you can lend a hand. You can also join the food co-op that's coming, and i also see you, Sister Neka, if I could get you to do it while you're watching, could you bring up the dates? for the extravaganza which will be held at the, uh, as part of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, 
50th anniversary of the unveiling of the Madonna and Child portrait. I see you here. If you could just put those dates up, I can read them right off the screen on my phone. It's a very important event coming up next weekend. I think it starts on the weekend of the April the 28th, and it's 50 years since that very powerful, stunning, and beautiful portrait, mural I should say, in the sanctuary of the Mother Shrine and Shrine One of the Madonna and Child, which of course symbolizes the mother and the black messiah who came through the mother. And for those in the Shrine of the Black Madonna, we believe that Jesus came as a liberator to the nation of Israel which was the black nation at the time, and I don't want to get a lot into that, but the implications of uh, the time period, by 1967, we're at probably the height of the black power movement, which for me was a culmination of uh, civil rights, and the shift from civil rights into black power culminates with young people taken to the streets, building institutions, declaring that they were black and beautiful, wearing African clothes, expressing uh, mad and major expressions of self-determination. And this was like a next level, for me anyway, of the civil rights movement. But it became another movement because it was no longer saying, give me rights, let me in, let me have this. The young people were saying, we can get it ourselves through what we call Kuji Chagalia and self-determination. And those dates are April 28th through the 30th. There's three days of events which will culminate in a, a very powerful, spill, powerfully filled church service on that Sunday. There's events the Friday night, which I think is the 28th. And I, I'll have more of a schedule next week. I'll be a little better prepared. And I will bring that information back to you. We urge you to come out and participate. There's a variety of events that you can participate in. And in keeping with our tradition, I'm again going to look at a uh, pull from the book on this day, African American Life in Detroit by the journalist Ken Coleman. And I'm still hopeful that I can get him into the studio to talk about the work he did to bring this, to uh, write this book. And it's simply a book that gives a daily account, 365 days of events, key events, key accounts, the likes of people like Miles Davis, Wynton Kelly, and, and other world-renowned jazz artists. April 22nd in 1949, Spencer Haywood was born in Silver City, Mississippi. He too later moved to Detroit and attended Persian High School where he was a stellar and outstanding high school basketball player. He went on to become a professional, he went on to have a professional basketball career in both the ABA or the American Basketball Association and the NBA, the National Basketball Association. And when I was a much younger man, probably more a kid, there were two different basketball leagues, just like there were two baseball leagues, the American League, the National League. The ABA, American Basketball Association, the Nas National Basketball Association. As a young player, Spencer Haywood challenged the league's eligibility rules in a case that would go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. During his tenure as a professional basketball player, Hayward, Spencer Haywood played for the New York Knicks, the Washington Bullets, the Los Angeles Lakers. During his tenure, he would after his tenure, he would retire as a four-time NBA All-Star. And the, Spencer Haywood really had a real interesting story. He, of course, was married to Iman, the famous model that was either from uh, Somali or Tanzania, one of the East African countries, and she's still around. Of course, she uh, later married, years later, she was married to David Bowie. In fact, I think they were still married when David Bowie made his transition but also Spencer Haywood had the misfortune uh, to some degree of having get, gotten involved with substance abuse I'm not sure to what degree but he was also very active in the substance abuse community and helping others to obtain and uh, sustain their sobriety
So uh, I'm not sure what Spencer Haywood may be doing now, but he has had an interesting life, and he was a major uh, contributor to the uh, life and viability of Detroit. So of course, we wish him an upcoming happy birthday. Key deaths during this week were, in 1969, legendary Motown drummer Ben, Benny Benjamin made his transition after a stroke at the age of 43 on April 20th in 1969. Benjamin was known as part of the team of the Funk Brothers who if you ever saw the documentary Standing in the Shadows of Motown you know the Funk Brothers were the brothers behind the famous Motown sound and for years and years and years and some of us may remember going to the Motown Review going to the Easter show, going to the Christmas show. You could go maybe for two or three dollars and see six, seven different acts. Little Stevie Wonder, The Four Tops, The Temptations, The Supreme, Junior Walk and the All-Stars. You could see them all for very little money. Then, and I've said this before on the show, I probably say it every time, after the uh, one of these nice shows at the uh, Fox Theater downtown, you could walk a couple of blocks down the street and get some of those at that time, they seemed to be nice White Castle hamburgers for nine cent or ten cent. And of course, going back in the day in the three one three, somewhere up in the mix, between either between the Fox and the White Castle, or just north of the White Castle, was the Arcadia Skating Rink, which is where everybody went skating before it closed and people started going to the Arcadia which was on Greenfield. I'm sure some people in the audience that may remember the Arcadia and later people started to go to uh, Northland and the Arcadia I'm sorry the arena I think burned down a couple of times and people ultimately began to go to the North to Northland skating rink which was seen to be huger than the other skating rinks but one of the turnoffs about going to Northland was they played organ music. And they actually had organ music in Northland. They had a guy playing a pipe organ inside the skating rink. It was horrible. But eventually, Northland turned in the place that black people went skating. If anybody that remember that, we welcome you to call in. And I always remember hearing people talk about, I learned how to skate at the Arcadia. But I also remember people talking about either skating in Detroit or going to Pontiac. And this was a big thing back in the day when skating was big. And I think for some people it still is. Anyhow, going back to the Funk Brothers, Benjamin, Benny Benjamin. And he is known, he performed on several very popular recordings, which include Money, That's What I Need, Do You Love Me, Getting Ready, Uptight, remember, baby, everything is all right. Uptight, of course, that was Lil Stevie Wonder. And I know y'all saying you, you shouldn't be singing on the air, right? That's why I'm a drummer. Whole nother story for a different show. And of course, he also was recorded on I, I Heard It Through the Grapevine and that famous uh, Smokey Robinson hit, I would say probably a, a signature hit, Going to a go-go. How many people out there remember these songs? This is the stuff I remember hearing as a five, six, seven, eight-year-old kid. Going to a go-go. And interestingly, I, I think I heard it today or yesterday. Sylvia Moy, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, made her transition either today or yesterday. And if anybody here that doesn't know who Sylvia Moy was, she wrote the song. She was a writer for Motown and wrote other songs wrote for other artists as well but one of her most popular songs was My Sharia Moore by Stevie Wonder so she made her transition within the past day or so key events for this upcoming week from the 17th going forward this is another blast from the past now I don't remember this exact event but I remember the person that I'm talking about I see you my sister Omalade all the way from Oakland, California. West side in the house, good evening, and how you doing? And somebody brought to my attention, Chikesha, uh, that Sylvia Moy made her transition yesterday. 1965, on April the 17th, today, worldwide wrestling champ Bobo Brazil crushes Jerry Graham in a match at Cobo Arena. 
How many people in the audience remember big time wrestling? And back in the day, who was the black guy that we saw in big time wrestling? Bobo Brazil. Bobo Brazil was thought to be by many the first successful African American wrestler and he was often re referred to as the Jackie Robinson of sports. And many people probably remember Bobo Brazil, who was the black wrestler, Haystacks Calhoun, The Sheik, Van Verpel, and so many others. And they were broadcast. You could turn to Channel 9. Now, I can't even find Channel 9 on the cable station today, but Channel 9 was the Canadian broadcast or something like that. They broadcast from right across the water from Windsor. And one of the famous shows that many of us in Detroit like to watch was Big Time Wrestling. There was another popular show, and I'm just this is just a test. How many people remember the Robin Seymour show? Which was a dance show with a white host. The host was white, but they played black music. And this this was contemporary, it was definitely before the scene before Soul Train, but this was a place where you could hear black music. Many of us, every once in a while, every once in a while, would watch Bandstand. And if it was somebody black on Bandstand, because usually for a black artist to be on Bandstand, they had to have made it to a very successful rate in terms of record sales and had possibly crossed over, then you would see people on American Bandstand with Dick Clark. But right here in Detroit, we had, I want to, I'm pretty sure it was called Robin Seymour's Showtime, I think it was. And if somebody's watching or viewing that remembers, you can call in and let me know. So anyhow, 1965, April 17th, Bobo Brazil. April 21st was also as a good friend of uh, the birthday of a good friend of mine who's coming up, very good friend from back in the day. April the 21st, 1992, the all-female Detroit Jazz Ensemble Straight Ahead releases their compilation entitled Looking Sh was a renowned and very popular all-female jazz ensemble. I'm sure there were others, but this had to be one of the most important ones. Their recording included several original compositions and a cover of John Coltrane's Impressions. The group was comprised of, and I think, uh, Straight ahead, maybe still working. I think the uh, personnel has changed, but at that time, and I want to say this, they can correct me or keep me honest. Just call in, and we can get it straight. But at that time, 1992, on April the 21st, the lead singer or the only vocalist was Cynthia Dewberry. The drummer was Galen McKinney, the daughter of renowned jazz artist Harold McKinney, one of the Michigan masters. Uh, Harold uh, Wendell Harris. Marcus Belgrave and Roy Brooks, I think I've got them all, were the Michigan Masters. These people were declared as master jazz, I would say of all time. I had the fortune to have worked with a couple of those artists and of particular interest was working with Roy Brooks, which maybe is a topic I'll talk about uh, during June, which is Black History Month. I'm trying to put some real nice programs with some music. Unfortunately, we can't bring it to you live, but June is Black History Month, so we're going to try to get some recording of some of the key Detroit uh, African-American artists that helped to make this town the great music place that it has been. Anyhow, Galen McKinney on drums, Eileen Orr on piano, bass on bass, long time, and all these people are seasoned veterans now. Now we're talking about 1992. That's almost 30 years ago. On bass, still holding it down, and all these musicians are still kicking it. Marion Hayden, probably one of the most working jazz basses, male or female, in Detroit. And not one of the most working, but one of the most accomplished. And last but not least was violinist Regina Carter, who we know now lives in New York and has gone on to a very successful recording career and a career as a professional musician. I mean, she's outstanding, and she is out there on top as a leading violinist in uh, the jazz world. 
on April the 23rd, and it wasn't a real lot of stuff. In 56, singer Nat King Cole donated $500 to the Detroit branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. And this donation was made during a press conference at the historical African American owned Gotham Hotel. The Gotham Hotel of where it was, but this was the premier hotel owned by African Americans, and this is the place where all the successful celebrities, politicians stayed when they came to Detroit. Part of the reason they stayed at the Gotham was because they couldn't go to the white hotels. If there's anybody in the audience listening, viewing, if you remember the Gotham Ho Hotel, call in and, and talk to us about it. I think there was also another African American hotel that was uh, pretty big and of the same stature in Detroit as well. Anyhow, Nat King Cole had been misquoted as saying that he was a uh, self-proclaimed activist and that uh, he he didn't need he did not support the NAACP or something like that. And he re he uh, responded to this misquote by one of the newspapers that this was not a true portrayal of who he is and that he indeed was a um, he indeed sorry we just trying to get the uh, Facebook connection back Facebook live connection back so that the other viewers can uh, see what we're doing here or to bring them back in hopefully we can get ourselves back connected I understand we have a weak connection via the internet. Anyhow, back to Nat King Cole. He gave $500 to the Detroit NAACP and he also corrected the myth that he was not, he did, he was indeed a supporter of the NAACP and this was confirmed by then at this particular event he gave the then Executive Secretary Arthur Johnson a check for $500. Now this is in 1956, $500 was a lot of money. And uh, Arthur Johnson confirmed that he had also made previous donations to the organization when he was in Detroit. And uh, Nat King Cole also confirmed himself that he had been in communication with uh, one of the officials of the NAACP, one of the national officials, Roy Wilkins. In 1989, on April the 23rd, and I don't know how I overlooked this, but on April the 12th, in the same year, 1989, almost a hundred students took over and occupied what was then called the Helen Newberry Joy Administrative Administration Building on Wayne State Campus. And anybody that may be familiar with Wayne State Campus, which is the uh, current cafeteria, is just east of the student center building and I think they may be connected some kind of way I can't remember for sure and I'm on campus a lot that was the Helen Newberry Joy administrative building this is where the records office was registration a few very important uh, offices students occupied the building and according to news reports newspapers and otherwise at a certain point it got to be as many as 100 students these students took over the building, they locked themselves in, and they stayed in that building for 11 days. Now this, this uh, occupation began on April the 12th, and it ended on April the 23rd. This occurred in 1989. The students took over the building after numerous negotiations for, for uh, 11 days. They pushed the building back to the uh, campus police, the university or whatever, the university officials. But they had made the lodged the demand for the establishment of an African Africana Studies Department, a full department, not a center. We know there was a Black Studies Center at Wayne State for several years prior to this time. Unfortunately for my Facebook family, we can't get a connection back. I'm not sure what's happening there. Uh, we'll keep trying. Try that again. 
we just don't have a good connection. I'm sorry that, that we went out like that, and uh, I'll just do better to have it together next week. Uh, anyhow, back to the city end. They had massive community support. Operation Get Down, Aisha Shule, several other community organizations came out. We drummed and danced on the outside in support of the uh, student protesters. We Operation Get Down bought catered food, you know, all kind of food. I don't remember exactly what the food was, but the students had mad community support. And I think it was two years ago, Wayne State had a celebration to commem commemorate that event and the establishment of the Black Studies Center, which I think it happened 10 or 15 years prior to that. And it came out by one of the presenters that Coleman Young had even been in communication with the students and he supported the students and advised the police not to harm or to do anything to injure or punish any of the students. And in fact, somebody else that was at the meeting said that the Wayne State Police were consulting with the Detroit Police and the mayor to uh, receive instructions on how they proceed. So Coleman Young was uh, protecting those students as well behind the scenes. So they asked for the establishment of an Africana Studies Department they also asked that there be an increase in hiring of African American faculty at Wayne State. And they also asked that, and I was just reading this information in Ken Burns, Ken Coleman Mans, but what he brings out in his book, they also asked for uh, the establishment of 10 scholarships for African American uh, students. I do know that they are, along with African, uh, requesting and demanding the Africana Studies Department, which would be a full uh, degree granting a department. The thing about a department, that's the most autonomy that an academic unit can have. They have the ability to hire, promote, grant tenure as an entity that still has to go through the university process, but that is the most autonomy that a unit can have in a, a university or college. You have centers, you have, you have uh, academic centers, you have programs, but the department has the most autonomy. They also had requested at that time that there be the establishment of a master's degree program as part of the department, which has not come to fruition. But what's interesting to note, too, about this Detroit has somewhere around 80% African American population and they have an African American Studies Department. They changed the name from Africana Studies to African American Studies. And interesting, you would think that the department there would be strongly supported by Wayne State University. There is mad research opportunities pertaining to black people in a city like Detroit, particularly as we look at the various phases that it's gone through, going all the way back to the first blacks or the earliest blacks, of course, the earliest blacks that were here, some of those were blacks that came here with the explorers, later, and I'm talking about in the 1600s now, 1700s, later this was a major place that uh, formerly enslaved Africans escaped to, so Detroit has a rich history. And even if we look at some of the transitional things that have occurred in Detroit, say from, we know there were two migrations in the first half of the 20th century, right around both World Wars, World War I and World War II. We get the decline of population, decline of industry, which begins right after World War II in the late, the second half of the uh, decade of the 1940s and you began to see things transitioning. Contrary to popular belief, a lot of people believe that Detroit went into decline after 67. That's not true. White flight began as blacks, black, uh, the black presence and population increased. So you get whites moving at a, at a very advanced rate in the 1940s. Uh, industries are building plants outside of the cities you get this white flight to the suburbs and you get higher rates of unemployment higher rates of crime anytime 
unemployment goes up, we know the crime rate goes up. So we get uh, another transition, dynamics happening in Detroit. By the time we get to the recession in the early 70s, Detroit has been is way down in population, particularly of white people. Industry is way down, and we see Detroit, Detroit continuing to die out. This, the dynamics in Detroit, everything that happened leading up to the Coleman Young era, all the things that happened during the Coleman Young era, the social, political, economic uh, things that occurred during that time, and even what has happened since uh, Young left office and how we find ourselves in yet what some would deem another renaissance. How we see black people increasingly coming into positions of power. And we see black people being eased out of power. All of this is phenomena that is occurring that needs to be researched and knowledge and information generated and produced by black people what has been happening to us and through us. So you, anyhow, April 23rd, 1989, the strike comes to an end. Wayne State, since that time forward, that it was agreed that there would be a black studies department that went from being the Africana Studies Department to now the African American Studies Department which began offering classes in 1990, I believe it was, the following year in that January. Now interestingly, uh, in a city like Detroit that is predominantly black, Wayne State is uh, situated in the middle of a black city. Of course they changed the name and changed the whole dynamics of the area that they're now calling Midtown. Wayne State has a very high failure rate as it pertains to the retention of African American students. The last time I checked the failure rate or what the retention rate was 11%. For all students it's only four, uh, 20 something percent. And I say this to say that when this sit-in occurred there was outrage and massive support from the community. Black studies is a discipline that was born out of community work, social activists, social activism, civil disobedience. And my question to the African American community today is, where are we on that? What, how do we feel about what many of us fought to establish and what are the returns for the work that we did? I neglected to say that one of the key people or the key spokesperson for the uh, the city and occupation was Daryl Dossie, who was he's also with the ACLU now, and he was a very outspoken person, and he distributed some very exemplary leadership as a spokesperson at that time. Also, uh, Brother Errol Henderson was involved as well. Those are the events for that for the time. And I urge you to look at, seek out, check and see what's happening with Black Studies in Detroit. And just check in. And if you can, lend support to the efforts to try to bring about some more positive change in Studies Department. Being a part of that department, I know that the professors within the department are working very hard to bring quality research, quality instruction to the Detroit community. But we need the community support because many of the administrators and many of the faculty members are engaged in daily battles with the administration to ensure that that department stays there and that it continues to reach out and bring in students from the African American community because it has been a vehicle or a, a pathway to higher education which for many of us, many of us at least think that is the solution or maybe part of the solution to our problems. Some of us may remember when Highland Park Community College was a major pathway for African Americans to access higher education in Detroit. Wayne County Community College has been that. We need to fight more. Anyhow, I want to kind of get back to what I've been calling the uh, War on Black America is a systematic war. I talked about voter suppression. I 
talked about the pushback against uh, uh, the Obama presidency and how it was synonymous with the pushback with uh, to reconstruction in the 1870s. There is a war going on against black people. What I want to talk about a little bit tonight, there were three events that occurred this week that I know about, that I heard about in the past couple of days, and this deal with the war from the perspective of the internalized enemy. What we don't deal with enough is the psychological damage that has been done to us as a result of enslavement, post-enslavement, Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era, Jim Crow politics and policy, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, civil rights movement, and all the pushback. As long as people of African descent have been in this country, we have had a history of fighting, and we we have engaged in the fight for civil rights. We've engaged in the fight for human rights. But the real question is us asserting that or trying to be acknowledged as human beings. The mere fact that we are human. Now many of us operate from the premise that we need Europeans to validate that. But it's interesting because we were the people that taught other what people what it meant to be civilized and human. The oldest human civilization is Egypt. People say, oh, that was 4,000 years ago. The culture, the culture that was first established in Egypt has persisted to this day. Does it look the same? No. But if you know what you're looking for, you know how to identify the remnants, the continuity of African culture. And I say this to say, and I'll come back to the idea of the internalized uh, oppression, the internalized enemy. And I usually oftentimes wear a shirt that says, no one can hurt you. I forgot the saying, so I'm going to let that one. If there's no enemy within, the enemy outside cannot hurt you. I think that's how it goes. Anyhow, three events. April the 9th, we see two women fighting at Bel Isle for a parking space. Very disrespectful. I don't know what was worse, that these two women were fighting. If you've seen the video, all kind of stuff hanging out that the people shouldn't even see. Woman legs up in the air with another woman's head in the, in the headlock. These are women fighting over a parking space. Men and women standing around them with camera phones trying to get a good shot. Cheer, cheering people on, cheering them on to fight and setting rules that nobody could jump in. When did we get to the point where we stand around and watch women fight and nobody, not one person, called the police, nor did one person take it upon themselves to say, this ain't right, we need to stop this. But it became a spectacle. And it's very rare that I would attack us. But I couldn't help but be reminded of how when our ancestors were lynched, white people came out to view it. They brought their children out to view it. To watch a black man or a black woman be hanged or burnt at the stake. How have we re relegated our humanity to such a place where it becomes a spectator event to watch two women act, make total fools of themselves fighting about a parking space. One person cut another person off. This is at Rouge Park, a park on a Sunday afternoon, which is supposed to be a place, weather is breaking, where you take your children. You go to have a nice time. And it's two grown women fighting, and 20, 30, 40 people standing around them, cussing and edging them on. Setting the rules that said nobody's gonna jump in. I got my blanks with me, so if anybody jump in, we're gonna make sure that nobody jumps in. What what has happened to us? The glorious people that built pyramids, the people that established kingdoms like Mana, I'm sorry, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. People that fought and resisted oppression. The fact that we're still on the planet today is a testament 
to our resilience and our greatness. And we, allowed our, we have allowed ourselves to be reduced to watching our women fight like that, daring anybody to take a position against it, and then making sure that we post this on Facebook, on YouTube. How can we respect a people? How can we expect a people to respect us? And while we're doing this, having fun, making home movies and trying to make ourselves look great and trying to get hits on our Facebook page and likes and hits on our YouTube page, you have white racists using their institutional power to take away every presumed to be advantage that our ancestors fought for for generations. There's almost, there's a number of states, but let me back up, during the last election, in Detroit alone, over, I'm sorry, in Michigan alone, over 400,000 votes suppressed. I'm not necessarily a mad advocate of the, what the vote is going to get us, but from the time that our ancestors were born here, there have been African people that have fought every step of the way. Now you have people. Jeff Sessions, Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, people using their institutional power to reverse any of the possible presumed accomplishments that we have made. The voters' rights, act not, the, the point is not to suggest that we made all this success, but the things that appear to have been in, in uh, symbolic of success are now at the point of being reversed. And while people are continuing to wage this war against us, we're wasting our time and spending our time expressing internalized self-hate, disdain for our own black selves, watching ourselves kill ourselves. This was just one incident. Another incident. I think it was Saturday night. I don't know, 9, 10, 15 black men just beating down two or three brothers. Broad daylight out in the street. What kind of heart does a man have to have to attack one or two men when you got nine or, other ten, nine or ten other people behind you? Once again, for me, this is reminiscent of many of the videos that we've seen in documentaries like Selma and whatnot where you see crowds of white men chasing one black man and attacking him knowing that he couldn't fight them back and if he did fight them back it was almost certain that he would be defeated because he was fighting a crowd so where do we get to the point where we in gangs converge on each other where is the courage in that and what has gotten us to the point where we disregard our own lives? What is the reason for nine? I don't know how many men it was. Nine, ten, the reports had a whole two men, man laying in the street with his head hanging over the side of the curb, somebody stomping his head and smiling for the camera. And where does this wind up at? On Facebook and YouTube. I mentioned the sisters uh, fighting. I, I forgot to say, after these two women got up into this bra, legs up in the air and all of this stuff, breasts hanging out and all of this, one of the women winds up cut or stabbed in the chest. And people sat around and watched it, did not call the police. There was a time in Detroit that I felt safe here. There was a time when the black, the, the race pride that had been engendered in us in Detroit because Detroit was a very black city for a very long time. But now, <clears throat> I'm sad to say that I fear my own brothers and sisters. That's bad. What's even worse, my 12 year old son pulls out the phone and tells me about this incident today, I'm sorry, yesterday with this gentleman who uh, just happened, decided, 
I found somebody I'm going to kill. Rolled up on this gentleman, 78 years old, who was walking from the store, minding his business, and just point blank shot him in the head. Live on Facebook. What happened? I kind of got a little discombobulated in terms of my incidents, but my son brought that to my attention. Why should a 12-year-old be able to or have to or even know that he can pull up on his phone and look at one black man senselessly killing another black man, shooting him in the head for no reason. Going back to the incident that happened on, at River Rouge Park on the 9th. Another situation, somebody videotaping this. This is on YouTube. Two women in a car chasing another set of women in a car talking about what they're going to do to them. The women in the car that was being pursued pulled up to what looked like a school. These women jumped out of the car, commenced to climbing into the other car, and start beating on the other woman. So we not only commit these type of crimes, but then we want to make it a public display and make sure that everybody can see it. So we show the world how we can act. I got a caller. Good evening. Welcome to the Get Up Stand Up Show. You got to make it quick. We got about two minutes. I would just say, kids, if you watch Facebook, the parents would never let their kids watch Facebook. Say that again. Hello? Are you still there? I think I lost you, caller. Thanks for calling. Anyhow, how did we get to this? This is about the war on black America that has been internalized and we are now actually acting as agents of our enemy committing war on ourselves. I'm going to leave it at that. I thank you for watching the Get Up Stand Up Show. This is the Get Up Stand Up Show with Minister Malik Shabazz. And I only hope that I have generated your interest and get you to continue to watch. You've been watching the Get Up Stand Up Show with Minister Malik Shabazz. This is the Black in the Day segment. This is the Black in the Day, Black in the, Black in the Day, and the three one three segment, an Afrocentric, uh, Afro uh, perspective on Afrocentric and African phenomena. I'm all twisted now. Anyhow, it's the Black in the Day, Black in the Day, and the three one three segment. We thank you for watching. We ask you to continue to tune in, turn on, and we say, get up, stand up, up, you mighty race, and accomplish what you will.